I'm Rosalind Carita, and this is History and Heritage. And today, you can see I have sort of an unusual friend with me, and she is outside of her cage. This is Tiggy, and we're at the Customs House Museum, and she kind of wants to jump down from here into the jewelry. We'll show you her new cage. We will take a look at the exhibit that we have here at Customs House on the Titanic, and we'll take a look at quantum confusion. So stay with us, we'll be right back. Hi, I'm, I'm uh, Major Jim Lawrence with the Salvation Army here at the, you know, the uh, Salvation Army Family Store, and we could really use your help. And anything that you give to us will help, to help those that are less fortunate in our community. And also, if you come in and volunteer at the thrift store or the family store, it would be great because uh, you could separate clothes that goes to those that are less fortunate in our community. Thank you very much for what you're doing in our community. At Salvation Army. From exploring your local community to finding new adventures in the outdoors and discovering the world, Girl Scouts opens doors to new and exciting experiences for girls. Girl Scouts builds girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. Through Girl Scouts, girls and adult volunteers discover the fun, friendship, and power of girls together. Interested in joining? Girls and adult volunteers are welcome in Girl Scouts. Please contact me, Bethany Kelly, at your local Girl Scout office by calling 931-648-1060 or visit us on our website at www.gsmidtn.org. Again, interested? Call 931-648-1060. We're back and we're standing in front of Tiggy's new cage and I am with Penny Eikenberry and she is the retail director. director and we are in the gift shop and this is a wonderful gift shop here at the Customs House Museum and I think someone kindly made this wonderful new cage for Tiggy. Yes, um, a volunteer did this for us, well for Tiggy and we were so grateful. His name is Dave, Dave Hibbler. Um, he is actually um, a stepfather of one of our workers ah, here. How generous of him. Very. And Penny was telling me that she was so proud that Tiggy could go down the stairs and that yesterday she actually went up them. So it was like getting a progress report on your, on your child that was learning to walk or crawl. So Penny, has um, you, you've added Zookeeper to your resume here. Yeah, <laughs> it was very exciting to see her finally go up on her own. Right. We, were, uh, we haven't put her in here permanently yet. We're getting her acclimated and just making sure she's comfortable. But uh, we, we put her in from time to time and, and let her explore. And, and so far, so good. She's, good. she's loving it. Well, and you've got some great pieces here, and these are interesting and fun and just as clever as they can be. Yes, I, I, we found, I found these. Um, it is, they're <laughs> handmade, and they're so cute. We've got business card holders, uh, recipe card holders. Um, salt, salt, salt and pepper, pepper shakers. And they're made out of utensils. So How? they're spoons and forks. Yeah. And, now, is this a local artist? It is not a local artist. Um, it's one of, we do have a few pieces mm -hmm. that are handmade that aren't local or regional. Mm -hmm. And this is one that has been so very popular. We are selling them very quickly. And I have to reorder. <laughs> really, those are very cute. Yes. And you do have some others that, you know, you said some are regional and, and you had some that were from Nashville. And when we looked at these, I thought these were so cute. I mean, this oh, is yes. just very different. Um, is, is this a particular kind of pottery? This or? is made by Donna Rizzo. She, um, her style is very different. She, 
uh, used to be a dancer, and so I see uh, a lot of movement yes. in her work. I mean, it kind of almost, you could almost think of Degas when you look at this. Yeah, uh, and this was just adorable. I had to purchase this piece. Um, it's really a teapot, clever. And, but she looks like she's just riding a horse. Right. And then some of these are very different. I mean, like little animals the, and those people. Those are based on child books, children's books. Okay. Um, Good Night Moon, uh, Babar, um, and this one, The Girl Who Could Fly. Oh, so those okay. would make a really nice gift for a child. I think they spark imagination and, and reading right. and, and art. So very, very nice. Very clever. Very nice. And then we did have, we, we do have some work here by a local artist and person that's very well known to everyone in Clarksville, Frank Lott. Yes, a big supporter of the museum. Yes. I'm so excited to have some of his prints. So Frank does watercolors yes. and then these are prints of his watercolors. Mm. So they're, they are affordable and they're local and they really are beautiful. Yes, he's got a lot of um, uh, landmarks of this area um, as well as just different things that he's um, painted in the past um, and he can also do just about any size mm -hmm. so if we don't have the size we can always request a larger size or smaller size okay well as usual Penny always has great things here at the museum and tell us your hours that the gift shop is open we are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 5 and Sunday 1 to 5 great Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to go from the gift shop over to take a look at the exhibit you have on the Titanic. Oh, it's exciting. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Penny. This is Amy Llewellyn. And Amy, tell us your title. I am the Curator of Collections here at the museum. Excellent. And so when we say that you're Curator of Collections, what does that mean? Are you the one who decides what to show here to exhibit? Well, actually, I work with the curator of exhibits, puts together the whole exhibit schedule of okay. what all things we're showing. As the curator of collections, I'm in charge of all of the things we physically own in the collection. Okay. So whenever we're doing exhibits that involve our own objects, I'm involved in those and also involved in the history and research side, okay. side of things. Now, do we own these? These uh, pictures or are these? Uh, this is some. This we own this picture. Okay. And we have this chair here, um, which is unfortunately not actually from the Titanic, but it is a period piece mm -hmm. similar oh, oh. to what would be used. So that's you know when we have that expression about rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Those <laughs> those are the deck chairs or that the deck chair. Yes, yeah, so it even has a uh, small plaque on it. It sure does. Saying first class. Oh, then wow. Only the first class passengers can use a chair like that. <laughs> <laughs> and this looks like this is a schematic of the actual mm -hmm. Titanic. So when this was built uh, in service June 1911, mm -hmm. world's largest, largest steamer in the world. Yes, it was building it had a number of issues because they'd never built anything that big before. Mm -hmm. So they kind of had to create ways to how can we do this construction on this scale. And this was built in Ireland, isn't that right? Yes. Not? Okay. Um, so when they built it, nothing had been built on this scale before, so that in itself is a story. Well, technically the uh, Titanic was the second in the line. Uh, the Olympic was the same size, but the Titanic had had a couple of modifications to the design. Okay. So the Olympic was actually just as big but not as well famous because it it did kept not going. sink <laughs> right and you know when we talk about the titanic we say how large it was but we also talk about how luxurious it was and just looking at this i mean i can see a looks like a tennis court down there in the bottom there was squash courts there was a turkish bath there were all sorts of things um, this is a picture of one of the first class staterooms. And, and this and is incredible. It's you know all designed to look like something you might have in a man, you know, fancy house. It's really, it does. I mean, you would think you were in a home that had just been put on the ocean. Exactly. And all the wood, and of course that's very typical of the period mm -hmm. that we had. I mean, it's amazing the, the craftsmanship that went into each one of these pieces. 
And then this is a great picture because you really can appreciate the size. The scale of the these are men the, standing there. Um, rudder, the propellers. Propellers. Mm -hmm. And th these guys just aren't even, can't even see them compared. And there were three. I mean, the huge, unbelievable size. So tell us a little bit about the story as we kind of progress here. Tell us what happened. Well, the Titanic left England um, in early April in 1912. And so that's why we're doing this exhibit this year, mm -hmm. that it is 100 years. I see. OK. Um, so it was April 14th uh, when the weather suddenly turned very cold, very still night. Um, and normal procedure at that time was keep going full speed no matter what happens, because they assumed that they had reached a level of shipbuilding where they didn't have to worry about problems. Okay. So even though they started receiving reports from other ships that there were icebergs that had been sighted and the weather was getting perhaps mm -hmm. unpredictable, they kept going full speed ahead and then did not have a chance to stop and turn when they saw an iceberg right ahead. Okay, and you know that's the first time I ever really realized what you're saying about that they basically said, well, we're so big and we're so good, we don't have to pay attention to those warnings. Mm -hmm. How interesting. And so when they set out, the other thing that makes the Titanic tragedy probably have more drama is the fact that it was its maiden voyage. Yes. Uh, that so, they, so many people were so excited to be on board, both passengers and crew, that it was this going to be this grand experience mm -hmm. they'd remember for the rest of their lives. And unfortunately, it was, and not in the way they wanted. Right, <laughs> right. But, on, you know, because it was the maiden voyage, they did, they hadn't really, they weren't familiar with how the boat maneuvered. They were not familiar with just any of those things that you learn, just like when you get a new car and you get into it, you know, you look for where, where the things are, <laughs> you know. Well, and another thing, we talked about how, you know, there was kind of the idea that nothing's going to happen. Right. And so they don't even think about it. Um, they never trained for how you would do lifeboat drills or anything like that. So the crew didn't know what to do. Did and they the have passengers didn't know what to do? No. The requirements hadn't been updated for a ship that size. So they uh -huh. only were actually required to have the number of lifeboats they had. Okay. So legally they were covered, but there were only enough uh, boats to carry maybe a third of the passengers. Okay, and so they didn't, I, I see. All right, so we have, and here's actually yes. one of the lifeboats. And so only there were only lifeboats for a third of the people. I, I never really put that together before. Well, and one of the other tragic things is that with the crew being unfamiliar, many of the lifeboats that were launched weren't even full. Mm. because the crew didn't realize what the weight capacity was. Right. And so there were only 710 people that survived out of a total number of people on board that was a little over 2,000. Oh, that is incredible. And so this picture up here, is this? That's the Titanic just Just pull. under, yes. just getting, pulling out. And then here's when it took three days to reach New York with the survivors. This was a boat carrying? Right. The, um, Lifeboats were picked up uh, several hours later by the uh, Carpathia, uh, which was the first ship to come on the scene. Okay. Um, because, you know, the radio was, signal was going out that the Titanic was in trouble and going down. And, but by the time that they got there, because they were far enough away, nobody who was in the water could survive that long. So it was, it was only the cold. people in the lifeboats actually survived. Right. And so then we begin in we begin to see the news as it unfolds. Right, because because the Carpathia could send the signal back fairly quickly to relay to say the Titanic has gone down. There's only some survivors, but it took several days to actually get the list. And so all the family members, you know, started gathering uh, at the home port back in England oh. and in New York City. All these people that didn't know is it my family member right. or not? Oh. Oh, wow, <laughs> that would be horrible. Okay, and so here, these... Just some, just, these are just some newspapers showing, um, you know, at the, at the right. time. Right, so it was the, the big edition, the, the, big, the big news, above the fold, as mm -hmm. they say, and, uh, and 15 to 1,800 dead. 
and neither of these actually show it, but I think it was in one of the newspapers that they coined the term of the Titanic being the unsinkable ship. Ah. That that actually, they hadn't used that term before the maiden voyage. Oh, okay. But After in, the, in the tragedy, it was just unimaginable because it was supposed to be unsinkable. Right. And then they start listing, and of course, one of the interesting things too about the Titanic, I mean, there were many people, but there were also a lot of very wealthy people who probably were the only ones who could afford to, mm -hmm. to be on this big maiden voyage. But then they start listing the names, and, and they come to us as names that we recognize from history. I mean, John Jacob Astor. Right. Um, and then, of course, we all know the story of unsinkable Molly Brown. <laughs> right. Well, and I mean, it was like ships at that time, we know the first class passengers, but there were second class and third class that they were only paying 10 pounds to, um, to get their ticket. Uh -huh. But while most, most of the women and children from first and second class uh, were, everyone made sure they got to the lifeboat safely, only 30-40% of the women and children from third class actually survived mm -hmm. because many of the ones in the lower decks just never even made it up to the surface to get to a lifeboat. Right, and so there was a tremendous discrepancy. Mm -hmm. And you know, as we know about this tragedy, you mentioned that there are people who died on this who actually did have connections to Clarksville or to Tennessee. Right. And I think we have some stories right. of them. If we them. want to go look on the other side here. These are all individuals who had local connections. Nobody who was directly a resident at the time, but for instance, the Carter family, Mrs. Carter's mother lived in Clarksville oh, okay. when she was younger. So even though they, are, they all lived somewhere else right. now, there still would have been relatives probably right. here. Right, so there were connections. So Carters, and then tell me who some of these other folks are. Well, also something to look at here, this blue text are the ones who survived, oh, the red are the ones who did not. So you can see about half of these names here didn't right. actually make it. Okay, so the blue survived, mm -hmm. the red did not. So we have a variety here. Um, Hannah O'Brien was a third class passenger. Mm -hmm. uh, her husband did not make it, but she did, and she was actually pregnant at the time. So her daughter was one of the kind of survivors who wasn't really aware of it right. at the time. And this Dorothy Gibson, mm -hmm. first class survivor, and like you said, that the many of the first class right. uh, passengers did, but then interestingly... Not um, all the men. Not all the men. That certainly worthy of some social mm -hmm. comment, isn't it? Well, one of the things specifically with um, Major Butt here, um, one of the accounts of one of the other passengers listed him as being standing at the rail with some of the other men, you know, stoically, as was they considered proper for the gentlemen to right. do. And saw their family off and they stayed. Wow. Well, this is a great exhibit and the pictures you have and the reality of having the chair <laughs> sort of brings it. And then the title, The Unfortunate Fate. So a hundred years ago. Yes. Good job. April 14th, on 1912, 100 years ago. Oh, so. Good job. And you have another exhibit that is, this of course is historical and, and sad. <laughs> and, uh, you have another exhibit here that is totally in another direction. Yes. And I wanted us to take a look at that. It's whimsical and, and different. Tell us the name. It is called Quantum Confusion. Quantum I'm just going confusion. to walk over here. This is Quantum Confusion and it is confusing to look at. So Amy's gonna explain it to us. Amy, tell us about this. Well, this is an art installation by Denise Stewart Sanabria. And you told me you knew uh, more of her work. She were more you, familiar yes, with Yes, she's it. actually displayed things at the museum several times. Okay. I am a great fan of hers. Okay. So I am very pleased to see this where it's a full installation. She's been here before only as one piece as part of a women's exhibit or something. Okay. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is an installation. She is from Knoxville, so she's Tennessee local. Right. Um, and does these woodcuts that is charcoal on plywood that she does these drawings. And so this is drawn on plywood. Mm -hmm. And then is it veneered over or varnished over? Or yes, some, some so sort of. So it won't be mm -hmm. brushed off if somebody touches Correct. it. Correct. And then she cuts them mm -hmm. and they're on wood. Okay, so the overall whole so this, look of this. So this story that she's 
trying to tell with this okay. is talking about parallel worlds and parallel universes. Kind of like um, Superman and Bizarro? I don't know necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> but she, she did talk about how she, she remembered seeing episodes from TV shows of Lost, Old Lost in okay, Space Lost and things space, like that right. that had a mirror portal between worlds. Okay. And so over here she has the plexiglass panel and you can see people are disappearing into the portal crossing between these two different worlds. Okay, almost like Alice in Wonderland in, um, what is the name of that one? Through she, the looking glass? Through the looking glass, there you go. <laughs> through the looking glass, yes. Yes, and, and, the, and the very classic response of just kind of touching and you can see with disappearing. the figure over there. Right. Yes. Um, oh. And so all of them are absorbed with looking at that, other than this one figure who is supposed to be the researcher. Oh, okay. I her, couldn't figure that out when I looked at it. At her I, feet, she has this clipboard, and that's actually attached to the ground to stay there. Okay, because I, when I looked at that, I thought maybe someone had left that there. And I did recognize this as a pencil, and she clearly has a different look. She's not, these people are amazed. She's looking at you, because she is looking at everyone's reactions to how they're dealing with okay. this portal between worlds. So this is the story, then, essentially, mm -hmm. of the way it works. So she's the researcher. I think that's kind of the basic part of the story right. is just the, the kind of the reaction and the thinking about other worlds that are out there and where do those walls exist between these worlds. And so in doing that, she's also, I mean, it, it sucks us in as mm -hmm. the person who is looking at it to decipher what she's doing as she's studying them. Right. So it, ha it, it has multiple layers well, of... Well, by, by having her looking out, it means she's not only looking at them, she's looking at, at us. us. <laughs> exactly. And we're looking at her. So it is complicated. <laughs> oh, so we're part of the exhibit. <laughs> and th this is wonderful. And I know we're going to get all the way around it, but you, it, it is amazing when you look at it from one side and then you walk to the other side to see how you disappear as you look into it. Well, and the plexiglass is very nice for being able to see through, but there's also that little bit of reflection, that little bit of distortion. It works very well for thinking of a portal between worlds. Right. <laughs> and this is, you know, for the Customs House Museum, I think that this is very typical. We always have interesting art and collections, and that's why it's different mm -hmm. than what we think of as a museum. And tell us what is going on here now. I understand there's a lot of construction. I know when I came in it was different. What, what all is happening? Yes, we have quite a lot of construction going on right now. Uh, half of our building is an old 1898 Customs House post office. Right. It's where the Customs House Museum That's got right. its name from. But the air conditioning unit was very out of date and we were having some problems with that. So we're replacing the air, the whole air conditioning units okay. and heating the whole system. system. The whole system. Right. But while we were doing that, we decided, let's go further. So we're actually also taking out a drop ceiling that was added in in the 1940s and taking out walls that were added in later and going back to the original wood floors. So that space is going to be amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's it will done. be amazing. Um, I have been there, of course, many times and ha held events there. Mm -hmm. And everyone is always amazed to see it as it was then, but when you take out that drop ceiling, I mean, that's a very oh, high, yes. that's, that is going to be an amazing attraction in itself. So tell us when you think that's going to be finished. Well, April 28th is going to be our grand reopening. Okay. That on that Saturday, we're going to have a free day. So anyone coming into the museum will be no admission and we want everyone to see all the changes that we've made. And so what day is that going to be again that it's free and grand opening? Saturday, April 28th. Okay. So we, we will be having it free. We'll be having some small giveaways for the kids. That's we'll be having idea. some snacks and things also. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a big fun event. That does sound good. Okay, so on a normal day, um, tell us your hours that the Customs House Museum is open. We are open. 10 until 5 on Tuesday through Saturday. Okay. And Sunday we're open 1 until 5. And do we have any days that there is no charge? Uh, the second Saturday of every month is a free day okay. every month. So we do have one free day every month and the rest of the time the charges are not, they're not huge. Can you tell us a little bit no, about the No, charge? the charges are in line with museums of our size, other places. It's $7 for adults, $5 for seniors or college students. $3 for children 6 to 18 and under 6 is free. 
Okay, so under six is free. Mm -hmm. That helps a lot. So the museum is a great place to learn history, to learn about Clarksville, and it's a wonderful place to spend time with your children. Uh, downstairs, we have lots of activities mm -hmm. for the kids. There's the wonderful train and a lot of activities that are that change, um, whether it's putting shards together that are like archaeologists or putting puzzles together. And the last piece that we're going to take a look at today is something near and dear to my heart, and that's Girl Scouting. And this is the 100th anniversary, 100th birthday for Girl Scouts. And when we walked in and we saw these, um, I can tell you that I wore this little brownie uniform <laughs> myself, and the minute I saw it, I could remember all the little songs we sang. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what we have here today. Well, as you said, it's the 100th anniversary. Uh, Juliet Gordon Lowe, who was the founder of the Girl Scouts, uh, started her first troop on March 12th in 1912. So it's so actually past 100 years now right. since we're later right. in March. So we have a variety of things. These mostly are all brought in by local troop that has been preserving some of the older stuff. Right. And then some of these that are more recent things from more recent girls. Mm -hmm. And Girl Scouts, of course, um, really has a lot to offer for young girls and I was in Girl Scouting through high school right and was able to go to Girl Scout camp mm -hmm. great experiences and you know it has changed I think the one of the wonderful pieces about Girl Scouting is that it has changed over time and the badges that we used to work on we don't have those anymore we have ones that are about computers and right much more technical <laughs> high-tech stuff but so, yeah, I thought this was great. This that's is a, a picture, picture from the 1950s um, of one of the early troops here. And I think you had a picture yes, we have another one. The, of the actual first Girl Scout troop. This is the first Girl Scout troop from 1920. 1920. That, Which, when you think about Juliet that, starting yeah. it in 1912, that's actually not that long. No, it was it isn't. one of the first ones early in the nation. Right. So, 1924. Um, mm -hmm. And then over here we have some collections of Girl Scout camp. And I can recognize so many canteens of these things. and the knives, right? And, um, some various other things, some newer and some older. Um, here's a handbook that was actually the one that she published in 1917. Ah. And you know, she, um, in order to really help scouting get started, she um, gave away her jewelry or sold her yes. jewelry in order to be able to finance it. So a lot of times when you have an event they'll give some little fake plastic beads mm -hmm. to remember that she sold her jewelry so she could right. get Girl Scouts going. And Daisy was actually her middle name. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have the daisies now are for the really young girls. Well, and the daisies were something that was added later. I forget exactly what date that was. Right, but that's, that's fairly recent, the daisies for the younger girls. Uh, but Girl Scout camp, you can't beat it, great experience, and we have a wonderful camp at Camp Sycamore, which mm -hmm. is just in Cheatham County. So a lot of really nice, wonderful memories of Girl Scouting. And so I'll put in my plug that everyone should join Girl <laughs> Scouts. Um, and this has been, thank you so much, this has been well, a you. wonderful <laughs> opportunity to see inside the museum, giving us a chance to really look at our history and our heritage because it is our history and our heritage. From exploring your local community to finding new adventures in the outdoors and discovering the world, Girl Scouts opens doors to new and exciting experiences for girls. Girl Scouts builds girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. Through Girl Scouts, girls and adult volunteers discover the fun, friendship, and power of girls together. Interested in joining? Girls and adult volunteers are welcoming Girl Scouts. Please contact me, Bethany Kelly, at your local Girl Scout office by calling 
1-800-227-1060 or visit us on our website at www.gsmidtn.org. Again, interested? Call 931-648-1060.